correctly. Yes. Uh, we were very privileged that uh, we had the opportunity of hosting a Fulbright Scholar, uh, especially of Bangladeshi origin. That was an added advantage that we had. Uh, and we visited Bangladesh on a similar topic. This topic was also very interesting because uh, a lot of us are forgetting the arsenic crisis, that it still exists. And it's something that uh, when he submitted his uh, resume and his uh, project summary, is something that I could not ignore, and I had to accept it as an as a, uh, intern or whatever you want to call it, as a young professional class. We are very pleased that we have a number of uh, very important people with us who have spared and made time to join us. So I take the privilege of introducing uh, His Excellency, the Ambassador of the United States of America to Bangladesh, Mr. Dan Mosena. Uh, Mr. Mohammad Humayun Kabir, Senior Secretary, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, Government of the People's Republic of Bangladesh. Uh, Mr. Murad Reza, who is the Additional Attorney General. Uh, Mr. Engineer Taksim Khan, Managing Director of Dhaka Wasa. Uh, we have uh, two more panelists at the bottom who join us uh, and then I'll introduce them at that stage. And of course, uh, Minaz is there. My name is Babu Kabir, I'm the director of BRAC for Water Sanitation and Hygiene, Disaster Environment and Climate Change. So, uh, without much ado, I think uh, it's time for your presentation. And uh, <coughs> let's try to be on time. <laughs> okay. uh, I'm a strict timekeeper, so that's a little warning that I'm giving to you. All right. Thank you okay. for that wonderful introduction, uh, Dr. Kabir. Um, I really am so thrilled be able to share my work in front of all of you. Um, all of you have really played a significant role in so many different ways in, in my past nine months. And um, to really kind of put into words the uh, just overwhelming joy I'm having in the privilege of presenting all this to you uh, is quite the tall task. I'll try to do it a little later, but let's get the show rolling. So, um, what I'm going to talk about today is, as what Dr. Kabir mentioned, something that some people deem to be forgotten. What's interesting, though, is that um, Bangladesh as a country is um, rather new. It's something that was born, essentially, if you want to think about it, in 1971. And that's where we're going to start with my look, my research, and what I feel the way forward is in this thing called the arsenic crisis. So let's kind of rewind back to 1971. You have Bangladesh, this newborn country the size of the state of Iowa, and it's got 90 million people. Now there are a lot of issues that are happening. What are the key issues that we should focus on? Well, one of the really high kind of areas of priority was the absurd infant mortality rate. There are about 234 deaths per thousand births, and of that, 250 deaths annually due to waterborne diseases. What is that? That's when you drink water from the river, from the pond. That same source where you shower, where you go to the bathroom, where you clean your clothes. Obviously, that's not good water. So when you use that water to drink, you get things like diarrhea and cholera. So what was done? Well, a multitude of aid agencies came together and said, what we're going to do is we're going to install two walls. Two wells essentially pull water from underneath the ground. And how large of a scale was this intervention? To give you an idea, in 20 years, 10 million two wells were installed across the country. The infant mortality rate had plummeted to 143 deaths per thousand births. And while the two well installation wasn't the key factor, it was definitely a contributing factor. So before I continue, what is a two well, you might ask? Well, as I said, it pulls water from underneath the ground. This groundwater is free of those bacterial pathogens that eventually give you diarrhea and cholera. So, you know, we have this beautiful downward trending graph that shows the success. We have done it. We have gone ahead and plummeted the infant mortality rate. But what else was happening? Well, there was another narrative going on. And it's a narrative that started in 1983. In West Bengal, a doctor found someone with black spots. At first, he thought it was leprosy or Hansen's disease. But then he said, wait, 
there could be another thing going on here. It could be something called arsenicosis. He stuck with that, but a lot of his peers, his colleagues, didn't really believe him. So then, sure enough, in 10 years' time, it turns out there's 40,000 cases of arsenicosis in Bangladesh. So what exactly is arsenicosis? What is this new disease that we found that's everywhere? Well, it's something that you get when you drink that water from underneath the ground. But what specifically is in that water that makes you so sick? It's called arsenic. It's a naturally occurring metal, and you can't see it or smell it. That's the scary part. If you continuously drink it for 5 to 20 years, you eventually have black spots show up. All of a sudden, something's happened, but you can't really do anything about it. There is no cure. And it's a gateway into all kinds of internal cancers. Eventually, you die, and sadly, it's too late. So with arsenicosis, we found that what happened were the tube balls that were installed were shallow tube balls. That means they were drilled into aquifers that were on the higher level, as you see on the very right. Can everyone hear me OK? Yep, yep. Go ahead. All right. On the very right, what you have is the arsenic levels. And sure enough, the lower you go, the lower the arsenic level is. So with that in mind, let's continue and say that by 1999, a lot of aid agencies came together and said, oh boy, we have quite the issue. What do we do? So they went ahead and they painted tube balls certain colors if they were safe or unsafe. In Bangladesh, the standard is 50 parts per billion. That's actually 10 times the standard of the World Health Organization. So what the key takeaway here is that if any two well had more than 50 parts per billion of arsenic, it was considered unsafe. And so it was painted red. And any amount of arsenic below that level was considered safe. And so it was painted green. By 2000, it turns out that one in five two wells are unsafe. And who comes out and says, we have the largest mass poisoning of a population in human history. 35 to 77 million people are at risk. What have we done? What's going on? That essentially is where my research comes in. I come in and try to understand what's been done since that revelation, if you will. What do villagers think of us, us being development professionals? When we go out and we tell them, hey, you know what, it's 1971, you are getting sick from surface water, so go back or go and drink groundwater. But now, all of a sudden, we're having to go back and tell them, wait, 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 wait. That groundwater, it's actually poisonous, too. How do we expect them to trust us, was an initial question. And then, kind of the third stage of my research is finding a way forward. How do we get out of this mess? So if you look at this map, the red outline is our areas where 20% of the two balls exceed that Bonneler standard. Uh, over the past nine months, I went to five of these districts and in total went to 26 villages and visited 1,236 households. So I'm going to throw some percentages at you guys. Whenever I do, this is the sample size. This is what I'm referring to. And whenever I went anywhere, what I did is I teamed with an incredible affiliate, BRAC. Why? Because every district has a BRAC wash office that I went to. And that means a team of people that will help me cull data, gather data, and understand these perceptions. Uh, I also wanted to give a shout out to my two research assistants at this point. Uh, they're back there. They actually helped me codify all 1,200 surveys into Excel and Stata. So thank you very much for that. Um, but going back to the field site selection, what we found was that we wanted to go to villages that had a wide um, variety of tube well contamination rates. So you have Manikonj, where there's about 40% of uh, contamination in certain Bazilas. And then you kind of we moved to more affected areas to the point where we went to Chadpur, where there was 99% contamination. All of these areas have a variety of different features. They're in different parts of the country. People have tried to implement different solutions. So we thought it would be a great wide array of sample sizes. So the first kind of thing I tried to look at was awareness. This kind of plays part in a continuum that I use to think about the problem and conceptualizing it. So phase one, we have awareness. What do people think, right? So 
there's this picture of a face, and it's called the empathy map. And with the eyes, you have what people see. With the mouth, it's what people say, and you go around the head. I use this model to ask people about arsenic. What do you see when you think of arsenic? What do you say, what do you hear, and what do you think? So what did we find? Well, unsurprisingly, 56% of everyone that knows a thing or two about arsenic, which is just about everyone, heard it from NGOs. One of the more unsettling truths that we found was that only 6% was coming from friends or relatives. What this means is arsenic isn't really discussed in the family, in the community. It's all coming from those NGOs and even maybe those that are affluent enough to have a television. So what do you see? Now that you know that you're hearing things, what is it exactly that you think you see now? Well, 40% had a good idea. They knew that if we drank this water, we would eventually get these black spots. Then things, got, th things started to get a little interesting. We found that 20% of the people thought arsenic was red. Remember, arsenic's clear. It doesn't have any color. But what is red? Iron's red. Iron doesn't have any health effects, but guess what? It makes your clothes red. It makes your fish taste bad. And it just looks gross. It has no health effects, though, but people are very scared of iron. Why? Because you can see it and has visual effects. Moving on, we found that 11% of the people thought arsenic was yellow. Now, there could be a million reasons for why something is yellow. There's the bacteria, there's all kinds of slush, there's all kinds of mud that could kind of filter through, but the idea was people thought that arsenicosis and arsenic itself had a color. Uh, the next kind of reality that we had to confront was that people don't simply say anything about arsenic. Only 25% of respondents actually cared to talk about it. 75% of the people never even decide to talk or say anything. 41% of the people actually think about it, and what they do say isn't really helpful if you think about it. They say, oh, avoid arsenic-free water, or avoid arsenic contaminated water. Try to drink arsenic-free water. Arsenic's a disease. It's frightening. If that's all you say, if that's all you think, and you don't have a way out, imagine the fear. Imagine the amount of scare that's incited within the village. So the next step of the continuum is testing. Remember, you can't see it or smell it, so what can you do to figure out if there's any arsenic in your tube well? Well, you have to test it through a test kit. And as of 2008, about 8.5 million tubals are estimated to exist in Bangladesh, and only 58% have been tested. Uh, this reality was echoed in our field site, uh, with just about half being tested. In our case, 667 tubals were total that existed, and we found that 71% of those tubals that are used are red. They have arsenic. That was good because that meant we were working in a good arsenic affected area. But what did we find? Well, first we found that there were about 34 households, or a little 3%, that went ahead and switched back to surface water. That's right, that big bad surface water that we told them to avoid, they're going back. They're doing it again. It is, subtle. It is nice to know that it's only 3% though, but then what interestingly enough happened next was that only 1 in 20 parents would allow their children to marry someone with arsenicosis. So now you have a problem where it's not just a health issue, it's spreading its wings into the social sphere. So much so that in Meherpur, we found multiple families that had children that were ostracized in school, males that couldn't find gainful employment, and some females who had no way out. And what does that mean? They had to resort to things like prostitution. So you have mothers seeing that happen to their daughters. They have younger daughters. What are they going to do to ensure a better, safer future for their daughter? They repaint the red to a ball green because of the social stigma. So not only have we undone, in some parts, the whole campaign, but now we're starting to undo our response. Now, another interesting point was that out of the 657 tubules, 58% was tested over five years ago. It's paint, paint chips off. This tube well, it was in Mighty Gunge, and as you can see, the paint's pretty much gone. So Columbia University came and they added signs. They said, we're gonna add signs so that they don't decay, they don't chip off. It was good and all, but then what we found was that the new private tubules that were being installed were also of a new color. That's the new color of the day for all these private tubule companies. Guess what that color is? 
It's red. Imagine the confusion that ensues. So then we can move to kind of the third phase, and that's the provision of arsenic-free water. What do we do? How do we give them a way out? So as I kind of stated before, there is one solution to stick to two balls. People like it, and so if you dig deep enough, that aquifer is free of arsenic. So about 84.4% of safe water options installed were D2 balls in a certain sample size. And then you kind of go into two different options. You have one option, which is giving someone an alternative water source. That could be surface water. Yeah, the evil one? Well, there's technology that lets you filtrate it. One is the pond sand filter. Why is only 1.4% the contribution this pond sand filter has made? Well, it's kind of hard to maintain. I visited six, and all of them are kind of gross. There's bugs, and people don't clean it. So then the next option is rainwater. Oh boy, Fallers gets a lot of rain, right? Makes sense. The question then becomes, what do we do during the drought season? Well, we make a big catchment system of 50,000 liters, and that'll help us persevere through the drought. But of all the rainwater harvesting technologies that I saw, all of them had one common denominator. Those catchments were gross as well. There were bugs. It smelled, and people didn't use it. So then you have the silver bullet. You have piped water supply. It's how Chile and Taiwan overcame their personal arsenic crises. But it won't work here because you need electricity. And we all know a thing or two about that. Uh, you also need piping, which is hard in decentralized villages. So then you go to the uh, solutions that go on arsenic removal. And one is the Sitco plant. I visited four. And uh, here's the story about the Sitco plant. It has two cartridges. One removes arsenic, one removes iron. The media costs 30,000 DAGA, but it's only found in Europe. So after three years, it's hard to find that replacement. So of all the Sitco plants I visited, all of them are defunct because of that reason. And so then you come to the solution that I've worked with. It's called the sauna filter, and it's essentially designed for those hardest hit, where no of the, no the other solutions will work. And what we found uh, was that it's, bad, it's good because it requires no electricity. It works off two buckets, and it costs $40. It emits no toxins, and it takes about an hour to fill up an entire coal sheet, which could be about five liters. So two years ago, as Dr. Weaver mentioned, I did come back, I came in the first time, in Mighty and I distributed 100 sauna filters. Come back this time, do some uptake research, and guess what? Only 28% of the people are actually using it. What about the rest? Well, what you see on the right, that's the story that we saw. Kids are running around in the home. The bucket tips over, it cracks. The factories in Kushtia, they live in Mighty and they can't get a replacement. So they use the one bucket. They think they're getting arsenic-free water, but they're not which is quite a scary reality. Uh, another thing that we found was that people didn't like cold water. Clearly here, the cha culture and all things combined have this whole idea where warm water is preferred to cold water. Uh, it's interesting to me because I love cold water. Growing up in Texas, it's really hot. But here, people hate cold water. In the winter, when that filter actually gives cold water, they go back to arsenic contaminated sources. But in 44, Nebraska, field visit, found that some ingenious villagers decided, hey, you know what? We're going to use metal coal sheets instead of the clay coal sheets, and we're going to store that metal coal sheet outside for 15 minutes. It's going to warm up that water. We can then drink it. And then some of the other solutions were simple. Going to the market and buying glue, using pins to knock out that tap that's clogged. Why was that kind of initiative in these brack field sites and not where I worked? Well, you had monitoring. You had a staff that checked in every week. So what does this mean? Well, it's segueing into my third portion. It's the fact that the system I subscribed to when I first came here was one where in which the technology kind of found the villagers. I went through my college, and I said, I want to work on arsenic. Can you tell me where I can get started? And then I got in touch with Mashuk, and they said, well, there are these villages, and..." You can choose whichever one you want to work in. Chose one of them and did it. They were the lucky recipients of luck, right? How do we find now a system where you can turn that model on its head, where the villagers are finding the technology? That way, the villagers actually want it. 
they want this product. And they're going to have that drive that those people in 484 have. Well, uh, Mashuk is one of my uh, affiliates. They're the manufacturers of the song filter. So I've been working with them for the past two months on looking at a social business model. That is the idea that you can make profit while doing good. That's what Mashuk does. And so on the left is the break-even price of one unit sold of a sauna filter. And on the right, you have how much a villager is willing to pay. I can answer questions about the methodology behind willingness to pay during Q&A, but what I want to point across now is that there's a gap, clearly. It's a huge one. How do you fill it? Well, what we found in Manikonj was that a pharmacist was willing to pay 10% of each unit as long as we sold the filter through him. That way he'd have these new customers that could also buy certain products that they were sick for. Okay, great. We still have a long way to go, don't we? So then, at that same meeting, we found an affluent businessman in Manikonj. He headed a private clinic. He said, you know what, I have a few nurses and they have arsenicosis. My patients don't like that. They don't like the idea of going to a healthcare facility and finding spotted nurses taking care of them. I understand the value of arsenic-free water, so I'm going to chip in and help pay for 10%. But here's the trick, it's only for his employees. Now with that, 40% is from cross subsidies, so it's how much they're selling when they sell to a UNICEF or a BRAC. Uh, the remaining 22.5% comes with the partnered aid organization. So let me give you a little more feedback, uh, uh, context. One is that when Mashuk goes ahead and sells a filter, they only will sell it to an NGO who's gonna go ahead and monitor the implementation. So this is so that while the villager is paying something, it's got, the aid organization has some skin in the game to ensure that there is uptake. So what are some of the key takeaways? Uh, first of all, people know that it's bad for you. People know that you are going to get a disease, but they don't know what it looks like think other things are arsenic. The second point is when it comes to testing, what we found is that, you know that half that has yet to be tested? Well, a lot of funding has dried up for arsenic. So then we go and say, okay, why don't we get the villagers to pay for the testing? Well, here's what happened. We went there and the guy, one of the guys in Jodhpur was like, look, if I pay you money, I expect something good to come out of it. But here's what's gonna happen. You're gonna test my tube well. Chances are it's red, because 99% of all other tubules here are red. You're going to paint it red, and then you're going to leave. You're not giving me an arsenic-free water source, so why should I ever pay you any money to bring this harm into my household? That's a key point I want to get across to the community. Uh, when they say that we need to finish testing, whoa, slow down there. We need to understand what happens when you do that testing. Final point. What I've talked about today are pipes, products, and price points. What have I not really talked about? The people. It's something that I tried to work on, but I naturally was forced to kind of deviate from because that's where all the resources are. It's on finding cost-benefit analysis of the most effective filter. And one thing I've learned is that you need the people to buy into you because they don't trust us anymore. They, they, they simply don't believe that we can sure, assuredly give them an arsenic-free water source. So when we take the time to engage with them, they actually first want to pay for arsenic-free water, and then turns out they do actually go ahead and contribute. And my last point is that with this people-centered approach that I've kind of found, our indicators are kind of messed up. Uh, kind of the particulars that we look at is number of tubules installed, number of tubules tested. But one thing that we don't look at is the number of tubules being used. What about the number of people that forgot what the test result was? We need to kind of focus on the indicators that have more of that human aspect. And with that, uh, I'd like to say that I have a lot more that I'd like to share. It's on the blog, called uh, Thank you. very much. Uh, a very interesting presentation and uh, like a thought provoking. Uh, for us especially the big issue was uh, we are the older generation that uh, started with the arsenic crisis uh, when we started working on water sanitation. Uh, 
it's nice to see the younger generation and I always reiterate that fact is if they return back to Bangladesh uh, and not stay back in the US, uh, maybe uh, they will be able to take the torch forward. At this point, I would like to invite uh, two panelists. One is uh, Peter Ravenscroft, he's the Senior Water and Sanitation Specialist <coughs> at the UNICEF uh, country office in Bangladesh. Uh, Peter is by education a hydrogeologist and uh, he was uh, not uh, too sure whether he was the team leader or he was just a member of the team of the British Geological Survey Mount McDonnell uh, study, the hydrogeological study on the hotspots of arsenic uh, that was conducted in 1999. Uh, so Peter has been here from the 80s, and uh, he has a very good idea of the conditions. The second panelist is Dr. Khairul Islam. He's the country representative of Waterway in Bangladesh, and uh, he's worked overseas and uh, suddenly decided to return back. So uh, we are very, very glad that he came back and he's helping us uh, in the water sector. So uh, may I kindly request you all to come. Uh, Start off with deliberations. If you want, very short uh, comments, uh, discussions on uh, um, Minaz's paper. So uh, the chairs are here. If you can just come up here, and uh, because you'll also have to stay on during the uh, question and answer, I'll now take your seats, and uh, you all can come up here and start off. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I first, thank Minaz for a really excellently presented and really challenging story time here. As Baba says, with the new the sort of next generation coming in to ask us what have we done and what have we not done. Uh, for me, as it asks us the question of how useful has the work that we've done been? What has happened? We spent certain amount of money has gone in. I think, still think it was probably what's been done was not in proportion to the scale of the problem. And I think Bernays gives us many reminders of things probably we've seen but haven't fully understood, particularly about thinking about people who are affected. And one little comment here is I would sort of differentiate the attitudes that are expressed by people. When you say, when it says 25% of people have nothing to say, I think there's something more in that. Because you have to split the people into those people, if they've had wells tested, where their water is safe. And then, of the other two groups, people who are exposed and have been affected. And my, the insight I've had working with a excellent Bangladeshi PhD student who just graduated uh, last month in, in Cambridge, is that they have a lot to say. They are very concerned and when people talk to them, they do want to take action, they are ready to take action. But the big group in between is those people who are exposed and have not yet seen any signs of any health effects on them. And these are the people who are in a state of denial. They don't talk about arsenic because they don't want to face up to it, because they haven't had they don't have symptoms, they prefer to think they are fated not to, not to become sick, which is not a realistic probability. So I think moving quickly on, what Mayor raises is the social business model, which was unpopular for many people, many government, many agencies, I think many people in my own organization, UNICEF, I think asking people to pay all this money to do something, it's terrible, isn't it? But the, the reality of it is, we, provide, we often provide services which are nominally free, but don't work properly. And what use is that? And the model coming through with the Schoner filter, is also a reminder as well that simply the market being a, an organization that would as the supplier instead of government is not a solution on its own but needs those support services it needs the help that consumer 
mark it, that people respond to it works well. Um, I would also suggest as well as a discussion point, looking at community arsenic removal plants, and if that was given the same degree of support and with a, a lot of benefit in the collective action and getting people to work together to, contra to make savings from the beginning to work towards replacement of media. Um, we've seen those things, I know that, you know, the first would say, UNICEF amongst others has f helped finance these plants like this, which are abandoned and I think rather predictably abandoned, because unless you put in the whole service, just supplying technology, government, NGO, market, is not going to solve anything on its own. Uh, the community plans, there is a model being applied, I think it was a Fulbright scholar here last week, who was showing examples from India, where this has been done very successfully. I've seen it myself, and it could be taken forward, and I think it might be something that, if Maz is continuing this work at all, might go on to look at that because the unit costs they are much, much lower. And you've seen that, you've highlighted a really big problem in the gap between the willingness to pay, pay price and the cost, the break-even price, and you're maybe scratching around a little bit to fill that gap. And I think probably that, I'll stop at that point and let, um, I will take over. Mr. Sure. Ambassador, uh, respected uh, Senior Secretary of Health, Ministry of Health, distinguished guest, presenter Minhas, and uh, dear audience. A uh, few weeks ago, when Minhas proposed that uh, I should be panelist in his presentation, I was honestly felt uh, humble because uh, there are so many scholars in Bangladesh and also uh, outside Bangladesh, especially in universities like Columbia, Yale, Cambridge, WEDEC, did so many works and I honestly don't know how many PhDs have been conducted on arsenic issues in Bangladesh. But somehow, because of my organizational affiliation, probably it has requested me. And I, I took this opportunity to actually synthesize some of my thinking around his paper, as well as what he are actually grappling about. Uh, I should start with a good news, or, or at least a good commitment, which is uh, prior to the election, last election, where the current government overwhelmingly owned, one of the election commitments was that by 2011, each and every people will get safe potable water, arsenic free. This qualifier, arsenic free, was a major commitment undertook by the government. Because uh, honestly speaking, as a professional, we were kind of, I mean, struggling to believe that within two years' time, such a huge problem of arsenic can be solved in such a short period of time. And, uh, but then at the policy level, we started seeing some good signs. As an example, the annual allocation for the water and sanitation sector budget was 800 crore, which is like 8,000 million taka. And during the first year of the current government, from 800 crore, it was raised to 1,400 crore, which is like over 60% jump. And in the history of Bangladesh, we haven't seen such a jump. And we thought, oh, this is the time more money will be addressed the arsenic issue. Uh, maybe the MD Wasa is very fortunate because bulk of that allocation went for Taka Wasa or for the other Wasas. But unfortunate, those people who are still suffering with the arsenic, that not a single or new project got initiated in the last three years' time. The project which has been running since 2007 is still continuing, another was in the 
it is in the pipeline probably that will be approved very soon and that will be one of the very first few projects dedicated on arsenic under the current government. Now if you look into the joint monitoring program which is jointly done by WHO and UNICEF, on 6th March the latest data for the globally has been published and again it's a good news globally that water related MDG has been achieved well ahead of 2015. But what does it mean for Bangladesh? That the access to safe potable water, which we reached at the level of 97%, has been discounted to the level of 81% just because of arsenic. Now, this particular figure, which was released on 6th March 2012, if we look into this similar figure in 2010, it was 80%, meaning that in two years' time we have progressed one percentage point. And if we do this business as usual, it will take another 19 years to have universal coverage of, say, potable water in this country. I don't think that was the election pledge at all. So we need to really go back to our drawing board, do the calculation in a fresh way, and remember what we have committed and what we need to do. Meanwhile, another important thing took place at the United Nations level. In 2010, for the first time, the United Nations declared water and sanitation as a basic human right. But again, this is interesting. If your speech of freedom is somehow violated, you can go to the court and ask for remedy. If your water rights is denied, you can go to the court and ask for justice. So these are very interesting dynamics that are happening in this country. Again, in 2010, there was a high-level meeting of all the finance ministers of the developing world. At least 28 of them actually joined. And fortunately, our finance minister was one of them. And there in Washington, he promised that a $200 million fund will be dedicated to arsenic. We are yet to actually launch that fund, but I'm, I'm hearing that before going to 2012 meeting, at least this fund will be declared. We are at least hoping so. Now, when this is the overall scenario, what message Minhas is bringing to us? What new knowledge he is trying to address? Like any other young person, he's, he's, he tried to address quite a number of issues under the, this complex issue of arsenic, starting from situation analysis to villagers' perspective to way forward, reviewing the technology and all these kind of things. Now, what is interesting about uh, Minhas's work is that this twist that we were trying to promote the technology without maintaining a chain of supply, repair, maintenance, when Whereas the needs should be that the villagers should find the technology. Now there are five technologies which are actually authorized or approved by the National Technical Committee. Now one of them is sonofilters, the others require much more or huge investment. Now can social business be the solution? That requires a huge level of discussion. But without going through that discussion, the point what he was raising is that who is responsible for ensuring safe potable water to the citizens? Is it the citizens <coughs> need to undertake? Is it the community level? Is it at the family level? Is it the call of the local government uh, institution? Some of those issues need to be discussed in broader length. And these are the questions that I take from Minhas's paper that what we really need to discuss. Having said that, since I got two distinguished personalities, especially Secretary, Senior Secretary of Health and US Ambassador, I'd like to mention two points. One, despite ensuring safe water to the level of 81%, and sanitation to a significant level, why the child and infant mortality rate is still that we could have done better. One of the reasons is uh, hygiene. 
and we still don't know whether it's a call of the Ministry of Health or Ministry of Education or, a, or local government division. Similarly, the water quality testing facility, should it be limited to the local government division or the health complexes which can run so many complicated tests at the Puzzle level, can they undertake some of those? To the ambassador, I would like to acknowledge our gratefulness that many of the US academic institutions have invested so much on arsenic, especially Columbia and I can name a few more, that we are really grateful. And the kind of knowledge that Min has brought in and raised the question, I wish in I, I don't know I mean what you are going to do, but I would I wish I would I see you come back and do your PhD on some of the issues that you have raised today. And I'm sure there will be institutions which will be supporting this. But having said that, I was wondering whether, because uh, uh, the point I'd like to make is that still in safe potable water, the sector development plan that we have prepared remains with a gap of almost like half a billion for the next five years. And in the overall water sanitation sector, we are seeing a decline in the aid flow. So probably when you are contributing so much with knowledge base, this is also an area where you can think about of your aid flow as well. So in this few note, I wish Minha's a prosperous future and I wish you would come back to do your PhD in one of the issues that you raised today. Thank you. So at this stage, uh, we basically will uh, take a few questions. <coughs> so if you could just uh, kindly, there's a cordless microphone somewhere floating around. And uh, if you raise your hands, it will reach you. You can ask some questions. Uh, Minhas or the two panelists, I'm sure, would be happy to answer them. Okay. Um, the first question that I can have. Can you just introduce yourself? Okay. My name is Molly Maguire Marshall. I'm another full writer. Um, I teach English in Chittagong. And the question that I have is about the arsenic crisis in India, specifically West Bengal, and any similarities between the interventions that are being done there, the successes there, similar challenges, and the arsenic crisis in Bangladesh. And that is for anyone who can answer that. Similarities and differences are worth mentioning. The first is that the problem emerged more slowly because nobody really seemed to be a, just an, an odd local problem and it took many years to respond. I remember being in Calcutta, Calcutta in 2000 talking with PHED, the Public Health Engineering Department, and they said they're doing it. We're putting in these deep wells and some pipe systems and some treatment plants, but what was striking there, it was out of proportion. They were doing all the right things or more or less the right things, but nowhere near enough on the scale. The main change since that time is they have received a massive, massive injection of federal funds. <coughs> and they've adopted an approach which is led by major treatment plants on the, on the Ganges and piping water across large areas of the system. This is not the only part of the approach, but that's a major difference where that no, no such initiative is there, but that it is go, it's a government-led response. Here, it's more broken down. It's piecemeal. It's done household at sub-community level, which leads to a rather messy solution when you start getting to the pockets. You've got some of the more motivated people in villages who are uh, have maybe found solutions one way or another, and nobody's picking up on the residual, who are the poorest, the least able to access resources, to buy, to influence government, to buy in those things. How effective that approach is in, in India, I couldn't, I don't think anybody could yet tell you to a certain Thank you. Your presentation is quite nice and I actually come here to listen, as mentioned before, by, by Barbara Kabir that how our younger generations are looking at this tremendous crisis. We surfaced quite a long time ago, and we still were looking for a 
solution for that crisis. Uh, as Peter mentioned just now, in West Bengal, India, the crisis is quite large, but proportionately in Bangladesh is much larger. And that respect, uh, when we first came to understand this problem, and after quite a few years of lobbying, both with even agencies and with the government of Bangladesh, we came out with the arsenic mitigation program and action plan, which I believe is still there and is approved by the government of Bangladesh. I don't know whether uh, really seriously it has been implemented or not. There's a lot of recommendations and I believe that unless uh, government comes out with full support to it with major funding and uh, major uh, uh, sustainable and long-term program, as Peter just mentioned, a piecemeal approach in community level, which is again the inverted comma, uh, this problem is not going to go and it's going to culminate in much more disaster. The other point I would like to emphasize here, arsenic is no more in our mind, particularly in the area where I work, it's not only a problem with potable water, drinking water, it's gone far beyond that. And as a next generation, I'm very scared about it. Unless they focus on that, we will, in future, we may land into a much, much bigger problem, which not only uh, create problem with our health, it's going to have tremendous impact on socio-economic, but in any economic aspect. For example, we mentioned about the green water problem, but larger portion of groundwater is coming for irrigation in our country. And that is bringing a lot of arsenic on the soil and is contaminating our soil. And the results in 30, 40 years' time, it goes unabated, it's going to be tremendous. It will be affecting our food chain, it will affect our productivity of the land, and so on and so forth. And you just imagine in a country like Bangladesh, with a large population, one of the thickest per square kilometer of habitation, where food uh, order is still very much on the thread. If one person uh, production is less, how much it will cost? And if the food chain is contaminated, what effect it makes in the uh, health domain? So all these things should be taken in consideration. And unless we are really serious about it, I'm afraid our coming generation will suffer much more. Thank you. Food security, uh, definitely. Uh, there are enough uh, evidences that uh, uh, some of our uh, crops are getting contaminated. But uh, this is still question and answer, so Yes, please. Uh, first, the gentleman over there. Thank you. I'm Matt. I teach English here. Um, you had mentioned that uh, as if you go deep enough, there is uh, there's no arsenic issue with the water. And so my question was maybe, I was thinking this is a more sustainable option. So my question is, what's the feasibility of investing our resources and time and energy in digging deeper wells? Yeah, that's a, a great point. Um, it seems like a great way out, because villagers are used to using two wells. If you dig deep enough, it's arsenic free. But here's the issue. You have certain areas where that's not the case. For example, in the Kulna area, uh, the more you dig, you can't really find arsenic free water. Why is that? It's because the drilling companies don't have good enough technology to drill, drill through certain sediments or certain rocks, and so you're stuck. And so then you kind of look at other solutions. So kind of the idea that I got, and um, Peter and Dr. Slug, please like, uh, provide your input, it's that when we look at how we can provide our sin free water, the first thing we try to do is give a deep tube well, because people are used to it, um, people know how to use it, but then 
Uh, there are certain areas where you can't necessarily drill all the way down, and even if you do drill down, the way the aquifers work is that there are certain areas where no matter how di deep you dig, you'll eventually find arsenic. And then the other more emerging area of literature that's coming up now is the leaching that happens when you have arsenic contaminated aquifers at the top kind of leaching into the deeper aquifers. First, deep tube wells aren't, don't work everywhere, but I, they are a solution that work. They're popular because for the user, it's just like using a shallow tube well. Uh, they cost more money but they're still probably one of the cheapest means of safe water when shallow water is not <coughs> suitable. Um, there are two possibilities on whether it's sustainable. Either the arsenic will never reach the deep layer, or it will. But what's very clear, and there's evidence of this, if it is going to reach the deep layer, deep layers, it's going to take decades. Because there's lots of evidence people have been pumping this water for then for 30, 40 years. And I would put it to you in this way. Would you not use those deep aquifers because someone might be exposed to a slightly higher level of arsenic in the future when people are being poisoned, crippled and killed today? And the answer, the, to my mind, the simple answer is you should do it. You should monitor what's happening. If it does start to go wrong, you bring online those solutions. But you have to address the problems of today. 22, the last estimate, 2009, 22 million people were still dr drinking water with more than 50 parts per billion. You know, five and a half million are drinking water with more than 200 parts per billion. This is the level, you know, they're going to get huge numbers of deaths in this generation when you're weighing that against a possible effect in the future. And the solutions that, you know, that Manaz has talked about today, the Shuna filter, any other type of arsenic removal filter, if arsenic starts to break through in deep wells in 20, 30, 40 years' time, you could still apply that technology to that water then, if and when that bad thing happens. Muhammad Yunus, I am a senior scientist at ICDRB. I uh, want to first congratulate Minhaj for his excellent work. Uh, he has done this in a very short period of time. I have had the opportunity uh, to discuss with him on several occasions about his work in there. Uh, uh, I want to uh, bring uh, one issue here, is that you, know, you look at the problem from social uh, aspect, social aspect, and one of the problems with arsenic is that you rightly mentioned that arsenic has no color, has no taste, and effect is so slow, the people don't see the effect. Like, uh, if you uh, think of arsenic, that is skin lesion, it varies from 0.3 to 1 per thousand, so it's a rare event. So people don't see it. So do, some people probably don't believe that oh arsenic can cause so much of harm because they see very few condition cases. Other things, arsenic is a poison which affects all systems of the body gradually and ultimately kill people from all kinds of cancers all kinds uh, associated with heart disease, even at um, uh, the uh, hypertension, blood pressure, and whatnot. So, but this occurs slowly and gradually. So did you uh, look at their perspective, how these kinds of problems, big problems, could be given to them to think? Secondly, uh, experience from Taiwan and Chile showed that even after total removal of arsenic from their drinking water source, over 30 years, there is still increased risk or increased death, not risk, increased death occurring from all kinds of cancers and uh, other chronic diseases, chronic respiratory diseases, including 
tuberculosis. There has been a lot of large body of literature on this. On, in our, our country, we have, at ICDLB, we have done quite a bit of research on health consequences, and we have found that there is increased infant mortality, fetal wastes, and then at lower size at birth, then increased mortality from all kinds of all causes, increased mortality from cancer and stroke, etc. So we have not yet been able, Peter mentioned that still 22 million people are drinking arsenic, which is more than 50 micrograms uh, per liter. Even, even more than 10 has significant deleterious effect on various organs of the body. So even if we revoke now, we'll continue to see this kind of impact on health, bad impact, health, bad adverse health consequences. Uh, uh, we'll continue to see. And the already uh, it has entered into food chain and it is affecting increasing the exposure as well as affecting uh, Dr. Babu rightly mentioned it, affecting the yield of the crops. So, arsenic is a real, very big problem for us. So, I think it's time, it's everybody's, it should be everybody's concern, starting from government and all of us. And there should be a <coughs> consortium of thinking and action so that we could start to remove this now, though even after removal we will have 30 years or more than that to see the bad impact. Thank you. Arsenic, if you can't see it, it's a slow poison. And yeah, you know, there's a very low risk perception that people have of arsenicosis. And so kind of what I did is looking at willingness to pay, how much would you pay for arsenic-free water? Turns out people would remember how 17.5% was the average across the five districts. Well, a lot of people were much more willing to pay for iron-free water. Why? Because I can eat good fish and I can have nice clothes and my water doesn't look so bad. But guess what? Iron doesn't really have that adverse of health effects, right? But that doesn't matter because, well, the alternative, buying an arsenic filter, won't yield me any benefits today, tomorrow, next month, or even next year. It's gonna yield me benefits in five to 20 years. And one of the things I did for willingness to pay is kind of, before, I didn't even tell people that I was doing research on arsenic. I didn't tell people that I was here uh, working on arsenic, that I've done it before, because then all these biases would be put in, right? And so I kind of used the whole Bengali origin to my advantage and said, you know what, I'm an American born Bengali. I don't know anything about villages teach me your ways, <laughs> you know? Uh, it was pretty much, I don't know, tell me about your day. And so I had a big sheet of paper with the sun rising in the top and the sun setting in the bottom and night in the, or uh, rising or setting in the middle and the night at the bottom. And I said, okay, here's the day. Tell me what you do. And then I kind of drew with my very poor artistic skills kind of what they were describing. They got excited when they saw me drawing. So they, well, actually, no, there's like three cows there, not one cow. And so I got more details. And then I asked, what are your biggest problems? What are your biggest problems that are so much of an issue that you're willing to pay your little cash to solve it? And the correlation we found was that in areas like Jodhpur, where there's about 500 arsenicosis patients, people are willing to pay for an arsenic-free water source. But then, because of that lower risk perception, and that's kind of what I came up with. It's not scalable, I agree, but it's something that the people can do. And if anyone else has anything to add to that. This is an interesting issue. I mean, I mean, who should get the final call? I mean, given the magnitude of the problem, uh, one of the school of thought is that the individual is to solve his or her own problem, or at the family level, or at the community level, and probably uh, some social business model can help help resolve this family and community initiative. 
On the other hand, I mean, we have just heard from Peter and others the model that West Bengal has addressed along with the federal government of India by investing hugely because it's a it's a matter of conscious choice and, and policy that okay, I mean, uh, we let people to become sick out of our synecosis and then they will come to our health center with cancer and all those loads and then the total health sector budget will address those problems vis-a-vis investing for its prevention. So it's a matter of, you know, policy choice. Now, I mean, are we not aware of all this? Yes, we are. We have, I mean, different priorities and arsenic is a complex issue as you have rightly mentioned that it has already entered into the food chain. But you will be surprised to hear that for arsenic, the policy level committee is comprising of eight secretaries out of them four are senior level secretaries and in last five years i mean because of who calls the meeting or i don't know what's the reason no meeting took place so i'm not saying that a meeting would have solved the problem and what i'm trying to say that because of the complexities probably we are not prioritizing or we are not investing enough so thanks again that these are giving us chances to revisit some of our you know, line of thoughts and uh, that gives us a uh, wake up call uh, when we need to invest and when we need to emphasize, when we need to strengthen some more focus. So, thank you. Hello, my name is Nadila and I'm a fellow Fulbrighter. I teach at East West University. Um, my question is specifically for Minhaj. You talk about all these different types of models and how many problems they cause and how they work. And then you end your presentation talking about the social enterprise model. But I want to know, do you think this model will actually work? What are your thoughts to it? And where do you think this model will actually lead? And one thing that I realized kind of uh, halfway through is that, you know, I could spend the rest of my time here kind of really digging into people's perceptions and really coming up with some really good ideas of what people think. But that's not really going to change anything in terms of their day-to-day -day lives. And so then I said, okay, I'm going to change my mind. I'm going to focus on this business model. And I'm going to work and see how we can maybe, within the little time that I have left, this realization happened uh, with about three months left, uh, what can we do to provide these people with arsenic-free water without government help, without a lot of other stakeholders? And this model that I spoke to is specific to Manikaj. And there are a lot of specific features, such as employers, employees, funding employers, that's not actually scalable. Uh, in Manikranj, that willingness to pay was actually low. In Meherpur, in, in the Meherpur district, in an area called Mujimnagar, the willingness to pay is much higher, but guess what? You don't have those uh, partners, those private sector partners, that will subsidize the cost. In Mujimnagar, the market's open once, one day a week. So, you know, I went there and I spent eight days and I only got to talk to some market people for four hours because it was, it, just, it was just bad luck. The day I went was the, day the, the one day the market was open. So that's kind of proof of how, you know, my model has limits. But the project's going to be rolled out in May and at the end of the day, if people do receive uh, sono filters and arsenic-free water, then, you know, I, I think that it'll be somewhat good. Uh, that I've spent my time here, and it's not just going to culminate in a report, also culminate in some kind of change for the people. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to very general uh, speech um, to something to tell you. First, I want uh, I want to thank you for coming to our country, and uh, Mami Gond is uh, my grandfather's country. Mother born there. So uh, I, after when he came first in our country, and this is the second time. So when the villagers came to our house, I mean, like by our relatives, they are very happy, and they want Minas to come again because they got really good things from him. And I, I want to thank American government. Uh, I mean, sending him to Bangladesh and give an opportunity. And in future, if possible, uh, please send him again. And this is from the villagers. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So I'm sorry to interrupt you. I mean, uh, I, I don't have any hard question or any uh, you know, technical question to ask you. But in generally, the villagers uh, told me to tell him to bring back again, if possible. That's all. I wish him all the best. Thank you. Thank you. So with that, we we'll close the question and answer session. Please, uh, for agreeing to participate, for being present, and for answering all the difficult questions. Uh, before I start the next batch of formalities, uh, there's just one thing we would like to say is uh, uh, deep aquifers, while I agree with Peter, but uh, we are not finding manganese in the second aquifer. This is something that nobody has mentioned, and it's in higher quantities than the WHO standard. So we have to be very careful how we harvest or tap groundwater. So that is something that uh, needs a little bit of uh, care. Uh, solar filter is popular in uh, the western parts of Bangladesh because you have that deep hard uh, rock layer which can't be penetrated through the normal drilling uh, methods. Uh, Bragg's philosophy is uh, we look for surface water, which again is getting into a shortage of Bangladesh, perennial water sources. Then we go for deeper aquifers, after which we only go for treatment systems. Uh, we prefer uh, sonar filter for the simple reason it's manufactured in Bangladesh. Uh, we know where it's manufactured. We have, as Minas said, that uh, Bragg is present in a lot of places. So uh, we have an office very near to where Masuk is. And we can always contact Dr. Munir and uh, manage to get the spare parts so they can repair. With that said, uh, I think. Uh, once again, thank you, panelists. I would like to now invite uh, one of our distinguished guests over here, Mr. Murad Reza, additional attorney general, to say a few words, please. Mr. Ambassador Dan Mozena, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, very good evening, and assalamu alaikum. It is a pleasure to be here tonight in front of distinguished guests to take part in a dialogue so timely so important and so crucial to our society. This is, of course, the topic of pure drinking water. The lack of drinking water is sanctioned as a basic human right by the United Nations. It remains a crisis in our country. According to the World Health Organization, 36 million people in Bangladesh consume arsenic contaminated water on a daily basis. It is said water is life, but for many villagers, the stark reality is that water has become an invisible poison that is now slowly taking life. I am very pleased to be here and see Minhas Chaudhary, a general man who represents the next generation of Bangladesh one who was born and brought up in America, that he has returned to his homeland with dedication and commitment to become involved on this very important issue. He has brought a fresh perspective on the crisis by focusing on one thing that matters most, the people. Not the technology, not the piping, not the filter, but the people. What do the people think? What do the people know? And how do the people see the future? We must work together on a variety of scales in order to help fellow Bangladeshis to understand the gravity of this crisis, the necessity of taking precautions against consuming arsenic-contaminated water and in providing opportunities for villagers to consume just arsenic-free water, but safe drinking water, free from all harmful substances. It is indeed a challenging task forward. Despite how great this challenge might be, seeing individuals such as Minhas, as well as programs such as the Fulbright program, give me hope and assurance that we will get there and do that we will do. So by working together on a global scale, water is the commodity
that will be in highest demand in the future, shortest throughout South Asia have <coughs> always become pronounced and the crisis will likely to worsen in time. We must act swiftly but carefully to ensure that villagers are aware and able to drink safe, reliable, portable water. While I have come to give you my support and has and I have great pride in hearing you speak today. I hope this is an issue you will stay committed to, uh, to as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, the next speaker will be uh, Mr. Katim Khan, Managing Director at Hakka Wasa. And uh, I would just like to also mention is uh, he may be eating of the lion's share uh, of, of the budgets. But the World Bank aid that you're referring to, the Rural Water Supply Program, but that is not only targeted for arsenic. It's going to go to non-arsenic areas as well. So please don't get your hopes high. Uh, if the finance minister gives the $200 million, then yes, great. But let it not be the climate change trust fund system, where again, the disbursement is so low that we're not doing anything on climate change. Mr. Taksim Khan. By the way, he's my good friend. We studied together in Russia. So, Honorable uh, Senior Secretary, he, he, Your Excellency the Ambassador, distinguished guest, it's my pleasure to be here today. In fact, when I was being told, and I was, uh, in fact, I had the opportunity to see the proposal that he sent for his Fulbright scholarship. And I was being told that he got a scholarship and coming here uh, and going to work in arsenic issues. So, I was a bit you know, disheartened. <laughs> because I didn't like the topics, because that's a different reason. For some reason, I had the opportunity to be in touch with those people in the, in the area of arsenic, although I'm not an expert, not, and because, you know, those guys, those who sell water, uh, sell milk, is called Dudwala in Bangladesh. And I'm selling water, so I, my friends call me Paniwala. <laughs> so Paniwala should not be, I mean, water seller. So Paniwala should not have that much of a good idea about arsenic, so I don't have. But that much what I had, I had a reservation about his. But when I saw his proposal, it was awesome, wonderful. I can't imagine a boy like that can write that sort of a proposal. So it was excellent. So then I understood, well, now he can do something which has not been yet done. So there are scope for him to do something. And now, after a long work that he has done and the presentation that he has made, it proves that he has chosen the right subject and right topics, and there's a lot <coughs> he can contribute, and he's contributing. So I'd like to welcome this young, bright, and gentleman, Bangladeshi American, and, and obviously the subject that he has chosen does have another lot of scope to contribute, and I'm sure that he will be contributing. And that is good luck that, fortunately, in Dhaka City, we don't have arsenic. Am I right? <laughs> Yeah? Okay. Till now. No, till now. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Dr. Yunus, also one of my ex colleagues. I used to work in ICDDF. And that's the reason why I know a little bit about arsenic. Otherwise, I'm not supposed to know this. <laughs> this is a good luck that we don't have arsenic in Dhaka City. Otherwise, I can't imagine what would have been if there was arsenic because we are extracting mostly the underground water. And that water we are supplying to the people of and the dwellers of Dhaka City. Mostly what we are doing is extracting underground water. 87% of our supplied water we are giving un from underground. Obviously, that is no more, no more ecologically viable. And that's the reason why you have shifted our focus. And we are now going for surface water treatment, surface water treatment. Although there are a lot of challenges in surface water treatment in Dhaka city. Because the peripheral city, Dhaka is an excellent city with four peripheral rivers and 65 canals. It was a God-given drainage system and water system. But unfortunately, we people have destroyed them. We have encroached all those canals. We have polluted the rivers. And that's the reason why now we are facing the from where now we do have a lot of water. Because there are a lot of water in the river, but we cannot get a portable water because of the fact that we cannot get that water for treatment. So this is what is the challenge of Hakawasa. And that's the challenge of supplying water to the people of Dhaka City. So that's what I, I think that's a great uh, blessings that we don't have in our city. So once again, I'd like to thank and welcome 
as well as I like to uh, not only thank him, but I like to say that this is uh, really nice to see that our new generation does have a bright, brilliant guy like young Minhaj. And I'm sure that they are contributing for the nation building in USA. And I wish they should also give a chunk of that for the contribution for the building, nation building in Bangladesh. So I like to thank him once again and again. And I wish that he will continue his work and he will come back again and with a more bigger assignment and bigger contribution to the people of Bangladesh. Thank you very much. for calling him the MD for the Law and Discipline. Thank you very much. I now have the privilege of uh, inviting uh, Mr. Humayun Kabir, Senior Secretary, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, the Government of the People's Republic of Bangladesh, to kindly say a few words. Dem Muzina, Ambassador of the United States, and distinguished uh, participants, Mr. and Mr. Minhas, uh, for his excellent presentation. First of all, I'd like to thank him for his excellent presentation. I'm also really pleased to be here because I had the opportunity to see, to see and also I am very pleased to see the energy that is present uh, in, uh, in uh, Minhas and I hope as we were talking with uh, His Excellency that uh, people uh, like Minhas who stay abroad but uh, could come to Bangladesh and uh, contribute a lot uh, in, uh, in some of the sphere of development. And, uh, I think I, I am also, I must admit that I am also, uh, my area of uh, work is not uh, really the poly groundwater pollution or arsenic, but definitely arsenic haunts us. Because we have a, an area where, uh, you know, the health is a very big issue and also a very big challenge. So most of the time we are now dealing with uh, the communicable diseases, and like uh, TB, malaria, and lot, uh, lots of other diseases. So we have to run hospitals, we have to run uh, health facilities at district level, at Uguzila levels, even at uh, very rural, uh, grassroots levels in rural areas. And uh, traditionally, we have been dealing with mostly communicable diseases and others. Now we are facing with the threats of non-communicable diseases. So if this is uh, most of the, these things are happening due to happening due to environmental uh, problems as well as uh, from our lifestyle. And within this category of non-communicable diseases, we place arsenic uh, ar and this is uh, this uh, the disease that is uh, uh, coming up because of arsenic uh, pollution. And uh, so this is something. Uh, we have to provide, now we feel that uh, we have to provide uh, our uh, medicines as well as build capacities so that our doctors and health workers who are spread all over the country could uh, deal with it. Then again we have discussed with the issue of, you know, that we are already burdened with lots of other uh, public health problems and those people are, have to work with immunization, public health issues and now we we know that uh, we have we are working with something that is really preventable. You have uh, you have heard that we have been able to address the issue of infant mortality. Not only infant mortality, our maternal mortality is also coming down, and we are on way uh, on track to achieve the MDG target very soon. And we hope that we could also surpass those. But new problems, those are preventable, are really causing. Uh, problems for us and when we deal with this, uh, uh, when we prepare our policies and others, I think we have to account for uh, the, how to deal with this problem. And definitely when people have problems of us, uh, this uh, arsenic and they uh, have complications arising out of arsenic uh, water, then we have to deal with it because ultimately it will be a public hazard, health hazard and people will come to health facilities for treatment. So in terms of investment, uh, I think it is better that we, we, and from public health angle, we really try to see first what is preventable. So there are issues of hygiene and also there are uh, lots of things that can be prevented 
through our uh, behavior and also if we don't modify our environment and change our lifestyles and all that, definitely we can prevent a lot of diseases and that will help us uh, to focus on areas that is really crucial for us. So, and I was listening to some that uh, whether can we really use the Abuzela health uh, complexes for testing. I, I really don't know whether it will be feasible because our people are trained to really test uh, things that link to diseases. We test blood, urines, or stools, and do some, you know, that uh, excess or uh, USGs, ultrasonograms in hospitals. But uh, testing water, I'm not sure, but uh, I think this, this is something we can think about. But uh, uh, suddenly I cannot change the culture of our organization and do the te start testing the water. I don't know, but I, I think this, this is there is some food for thought, and uh, if we have the capacities. But at the same time, we also have a responsibility for food safety, and we recognize this is an important area. And gradually, we are trying to address these issues. In that case, again, safe water is very much uh, closely related to food safety, and then also we can uh, really work on this and. Uh, I, I think we will have a greater role in that case, also from the viewpoint of food safety and others. And not, in fact, if we look at, as a nation, really we have been, uh, what should I say, that uh, we have allowed ourselves to use contaminated water and uh, in fact the food that we are eating. Already this is, uh, uh, in the future, we have heard from Dr. Mahabdur Rahman that ultimately it will enter our food chain and I don't know what can happen. But already now, at the moment, I know that the doctors are asking people, uh, the kids not to eat uh, fruits because that's also typically man-made thing. And uh, it, is not, it is not something coming up from environmental uh, 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 degradation. So this is because how we treat our food, because we sell food in a manner that uh, people, so this is also causing food scarce and it is no less a problem, I can tell you. So food safety and lots of things really on our shoulder from Ministry of Health, but uh, definitely I can assure you that uh, we also look at this, uh, also this is a very important issue for us because ultimately I think it because the Ministry of Health will have to deal with the people who are suffering from these diseases and then our budget, the amount we are allocating now would go up and up because uh, uh, and uh, I think the one interesting thing was that people, we have been asking that whether there is willingness to pay, uh, the people's willingness to pay. If you look at our people, they are really paying for a lot of things because when there is a health hazard, they are spending all their uh, lifetime saving and also their properties and everything to uh, clean up the health and others. So I would say that there might be a lot of things have to be done for really raising awareness and lots of other things. And then people would see a value in it and definitely they will be ready to pay. I, I hope on that, that, is that uh, something is missing on our part as well as uh, that uh, what should be done. And so I don't want to take long, but I also, I, I think, I thank Minhas again, and also we should, uh, the thanks, uh, we should thank the full pride because within their program, they are uh, sending people from, with the Bangladeshi origin to, who can speak the language of our native language, the Bangla, and work there, and uh, also know actually what is in their field. And this will definitely uh, establish a link with, with uh, people who have been, maybe who have not been grown up in this uh, land, but they can come back. And so I also want to thank uh, Fulbright and I also want to thank US government for uh, their collaboration in many areas and also the offer we received. And I just, uh, in the, before this uh, uh, meeting, His Excellency was telling that uh, there would be people who would be working in public health areas in our uh, ministries and others. So thanks, thank you all, and also thank you for giving me this opportunity to be present at this meeting. Thank you, Mr. Hatsuki. Uh, I now have the privilege of calling upon His Excellency, the U.S. Ambassador to Bangladesh, Mr. Dev Kusama. Good evening, everybody. Mr. Secretary, Mr. Additional Attorney General, 
Mr. Engineer, Mr. Bashir, Mr. Babar, rather, Dr. Babar, Minhaj, honored guests and friends, water. Water. Minhaj chose his topic well. Water. Water looms ever larger on the global scope of challenges. Water, both here in Bangladesh and around the world. Minhaj spoke convincingly of the deadly realities Bangladeshi villagers confront daily as they seek safe drinking water. A decade ago, when I last lived in Bangladesh, I too witnessed firsthand the challenges that villagers face when procuring safe drinking water. To be frank, to be frank, villagers then often fail to fully appreciate the insidious nature of arsenic, that it is a stealth killer. You don't taste it, you don't see it, and its deadly impact on the human body is deceptively gradual and indiscernible on a daily basis. Thanks to Minhaj's intensive work and that of others, the destructive nature of arsenic is now better understood and perhaps villagers more often now make the wiser decision in avoiding consumption of arsenic-laced water. Minhaj, I trust, is deeply proud of the legacy he leaves in deepening the understanding of how villagers perceive and respond to the threat of arsenic. Minhaj's work focuses on one key aspect of water in the Bangladeshi equation of life. I want to explore beyond. Earlier this month, I visited Potuakali in southern Bangladesh and there experienced another aspect of water that bears heavy implications for Bangladesh the increasing salinity of the water to such an extent that irrigation from the rivers and from shallow tube wells is no longer possible and crop production is limited to a single harvest a year. Little wonder, little wonder that southern Bangladesh is one of the nation's poorest areas, which is why we the government of the United States, in partnership with the Bangladesh government, selected that area as the focus for President Obama's landmark Feed the Future program, an initiative to enable the world to feed a surging population of nine billion people within my lifetime. Water looms large in another sense, <coughs> national security. Last week, at Secretary Hillary Clinton's request, the United States government released an assessment on global water security. The bottom line of that assessment is that over the next two or three decades, many regions of the world will experience severe water challenges and that these challenges will increase regional tensions. Certainly, South Asia, North America, two regions that I know well, have experienced already their fair share of tensions over the sharing of water. So, you can see why Minhaj chose his topic well, water. 
<coughs> that is the beauty of the Fulbright program, which enables thousands of scholars from America and from 155 other countries around the world to identify and research the key issues of the day. And we have with us tonight a dozen other American Fulbrighters who are here researching a wide variety of topics across Bangladesh. I believe that few have chosen a more timely and more critical issue than Nihaj. I thank him deeply for the hard work he expended to make this significant contribution to understanding better the challenges posed by arsenic to millions of villagers living across Bangladesh. Truly, the topic, water, water, water is an essential topic that will confront and challenge Bangladesh for the years, for the decades to come. Before I formally close uh, this event for tonight, there is of course a second part waiting outside, which is a dinner, and we hope that you would all graciously accept uh, the invitation to join us with the dinner. Uh, it would be very rare of me not to just recollect a few names, uh, apart from the distinguished people sitting on the dais. Uh, I found it chair, Mrs. Grace Mazenda, if I'm not mistaken, uh, for kindly being here, the Fulbrighters, for turning out in large numbers to support us, fellow uh, Fulbrighter, uh, Professor Mahmoud uh, uh, on very short notice, because he's been a pioneer in, in the arsenic issue, <coughs> and Ranjit from Dhaka Community Hospital, uh, Minaj's friends, colleagues, uh, research assistants who helped him through, uh, people from the American Center, and the embassy, uh, brand staff, <coughs> the one who could come. Uh, so thank you very, very much. Uh, Brack is very privileged that uh, you all did accept our invitation. Of course, the panelists have already thanked. And uh, it's a great honor that we did manage to host Fulbrighter. Uh, we have a few more students. Normally, our exchange program is with Duke, uh, Michigan, uh, George Washington University. And I'm again doubly privileged that I'm supervising a PhD scholar from Yale. So that's a privilege that I uh, do take. Uh, I never knew that uh, his father uh, also is very known to us. We accepted him on his resume without his father's name and on the basis of his proposal. It's only later on, uh, nearing the end, that he mentioned his father was so and so. And then I said, oh, then I should give you more attention. <laughs> Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, dinner is waiting outside. Uh, may I kindly invite you to join?